Folks, virtually, we're about to start with uh, Greg Madison from card.com yeah. on security. So, thanks. Yeah. Um, sorry, did you, you said a half an hour or an hour? Uh, hour is totally cool. Okay, hour is what I've got. Yeah. Just right. wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be like yeah, speed no, no. talking through it more than I already do. Yeah. Um, I also noticed there's like a little man attached to the tile there. So, this is a booby trap. I, I, I caught you. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. Um, it's carry all over. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, good morning, uh, everybody, or good day, depending on where you are. Um, I recognize this is a group of people interested in earth sciences, and you're here in a pretty beautiful place on earth, and you decided to be in a windowless climate-controlled area to hear uh, me speak. So um, thanks very much for that. I hope that I can live up to your expectations. Um, so I've got, uh, let's see what I can do to make this fit a little better. Um, so this is, um, these slides are online. Um, it's a Reveal.js set of slides, so it's, it's all just HTML. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I guess somebody's probably already copied it into the Google, um, into the shared Google Notes, but I will uh, make sure that it gets in there one way or another. Um, I'm uh, Greg Kanadison, or at Greggles on, on Twitter and Drupal.org and IRC. Um, and just a little bit about me. I've been working with Drupal for eight, eight, uh, a little over eight years. Anybody, anybody beat me with that? Anybody longer? No? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm, I'm pretty interested in security. I've been working on the Drupal security team for a, a pretty long time. Um, my, my interest in security is really just inside of the realm of Drupal. Um, I didn't have like a background in security before that. Um, so my, um, the way that I think about security is sort of um, aligned with how Drupal thinks about it, um, you know, be, by virtue of that fact. Um, so if there's anybody who has feedback from outside of the Drupal world, I'm always interested in hearing that, um, just to see what we can do to adopt best practices from the broader world. Um, I wrote a book called Cracking Drupal, which is uh, a book about Drupal security. It was written when Drupal 7 was sort of in the process of coming out uh, close to the end, so it's still pretty relevant for um, you know, Drupal 7. I imagine most folks are on Drupal 7 at this point. Um, and uh, the, the concepts haven't changed that much, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, I work at card.com, as, as Adam mentioned, which is uh, we're a, a prepaid debit card issuer. Um, so we, we're, you know, from the perspective, we're, uh, let's see, what is it, modern alternative to a branch bank um, <laughs> is our, our tagline. Um, and just in case uh, Earth Sciences um, doesn't give you passion anymore, we are hiring, so got to throw in that mention, right? Um, so we have a lot of different things to potentially try to cover today, right? The, the world of security is vast, which I think is one of the things that really makes it a challenge, is that um, you know, there's so many different places that you have to get security right, uh, and an attacker only has to find one mistake in order for them to be successful. You know, on, the, on, the, on our side, we have to make everything perfect. On their side, they just have to find one problem. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to try to cover a little bit of all of these things. Um, and uh, hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for questions or, you know, during the coffee break, I'll be here for at least a little bit for questions. Um, and so if we don't go too far enough into a topic that you're interested in, I'm certainly happy to continue that. And uh, there's also um, uh, groups.drupal.org slash security. There's a, a resources slide at the end where we can, you know, continue the conversation after this um, as well. Um, so just in general, I mean, I, I imagine that some of this stuff is sort of mandated for, um, for most of you at a policy level, right? Like, you just don't have the option to use FTP, probably. Um, or if you do, you're doing it inside of a VPN. Um, but some of this is just sort of general operational security stuff where, you know, have good passwords, right? Um, probably you're all forced to have good passwords. Um, but, but if there is a place where you're not forced, be sure to use your own, you know, good knowledge about what it means to have a strong password. Um, you know, server environment, how, how many people are um, actually, I have a lot of questions for you guys actually, so how many people are um, LAMP versus um, Microsoft versus like uh, some other kind of Unix? So LAMP, yeah? Most, lots of people? Windows? Not so many Windows. Yeah? Both? Okay, yeah. And I'm talking mostly about server environment. Um, and then uh, other like Unix, like Solaris or something like that, yeah? Okay, a bit of that as well. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously a ton of things to do there as well, right? Um, lots of best practices around security um, at the server level. And, and that's kind of, um, in my opinion, somewhat out of the scope of what I'm trying to talk about today. But Real yeah, quick, oh, I sorry. Think, I think the WebEx folks said that I forgot to share the desktop, so let's uh, oh, okay. do that. My, my apologies. Uh, how do I get out of this full screen thing? 
and over to WebEx. Yep, and let's see. Oh, just click share my desktop. Okay. There we go. Sorry about the that. The big button in the middle. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Okay. <coughs> Better now? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay. You feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you, you didn't miss much, and the, the slides are online, so hopefully you've already got a link to them. Um, you didn't miss much in terms of slides, anyway. Um, so one thing, you know, at, at Linux server level, right, like talk about passwords, but also requiring SSH keys, using two-factor authentication at that level if you can. Um, you know, what, whatever you can do to harden that environment is always a great idea. Um, another, another great tip, I think, related to security, but people don't always think about it this way, is, is that you need to have good backups and be sure that they actually work. Um, so often people go to look in the backup file and it's like this zip file that has nothing in it or a bunch of zero byte um, you know, files inside of it. So be sure that you check in on those periodically to make sure they work. Um, another sort of important topic there about backups uh, is the idea that backups probably will eventually get leaked. Um, you know, you, you've got a backup of your database on your laptop, right, or, or on a USB stick somewhere. You, you know, you transfer it to somebody else and you put it on your phone um, or you email it to them, right? Lots of relatively insecure methods for sharing backups for development purposes. And so what I encourage you to do is make it part of the process of making the backups, that there's a copy of the backup that's made, and then, and then what, what um, some people refer to as sanitizing that backup. So basically destroying all the passwords inside of there, changing all the email addresses to be nonsense, um, you know, just looking at all of it to understand what is the sensitive data inside of this database and how can I get rid of that sensitive data so that, you know, ideally somebody, you can just hand out copies of your backups to anybody and you don't worry about it because the information that's inside of there is no longer secret. Um, it's something that, you know, used to stress me out a lot thinking about all of the backups that were on people's laptops and now that we've started this practice of sanitizing, I don't worry about it so much anymore. Um, so that, that uh, sanitized backups is a link to an article on Acquia's website where they have a couple of different strategies for uh, sanitizing your backup. But it's, it's something that's even incorporated into the Drush, com uh, Drush SQL dump command or you can use a Drush SQL sanitize. Um, so if you're leveraging that, there are some contributed modules on Drupal.org even that have hooks so that when that, when that module is enabled, Drush will be able to sanitize the secret data for that module. Secret. Um, so some general tips. Um, roles and permissions, I think, are surprisingly important in the Drupal world. Um, it's sort of like, you know, when we think about security, often people jump to code level stuff. But there's a lot of problems that can be introduced as at, at the configuration level, and I think roles and permissions are a big area there. Um, I don't really have a lot of advice for that other than, um, other than just like pay attention when you're, when, you know, there's this giant sea of checkboxes and you're like, man, which checkbox am I trying to click on? Um, so just really pay attention as you go through that and periodically audit it, right? So you can log in as a different role on your site and click around and make sure that whatever is available to you should actually be available to you. Um, another area that can easily be misconfigured are text formats. Uh, so this is also known as input formats in Drupal 6. Um, but that's where you define which HTML tags are, um, are allowed to be used by which roles on your site. Um, and I'll get to some examples of that a little bit later and some tools for auditing it. Um, another thing is the, the PHP module. So basically the idea, um, or my, my feeling about the PHP module is that it's sort of a crutch that people have used sometimes, but you want to like try it out in a development environment, but quickly migrate all of your code into a module or into your theme, whatever it, wherever it really belongs, and not actually use the PHP module, not use the ability to input PHP via um, the, the web browser interface. And the, the main reason for that um, is, is um, basically that if somebody takes, takes over your session or somebody grabs your computer while it's still logged in, they can go to your Drupal site and they can, pretend, they can do whatever you have the ability to do. Um, so that's a scenario that is relatively possible, right? Is that somebody will steal your credentials or steal your, your session while, while it's still live. So by limiting their ability to input PHP inside of the browser interface, you limit what kinds of attacks they can do. They're limited now so that they can look at the information that's inside of the Drupal site, but they can't use your Drupal site as a pivot point to make attacks on other parts of your infrastructure um, because they don't have the ability to execute whatever kind of PHP code they want. Um, so I've got, uh, here it is. Um, so the very next slide is, is about some different modules for enhancing security. And everybody seems to have 
um, their own suggestions about what they, what they like or don't like. These are the ones that I think are um, pretty solid modules. So the very first one there, Paranoia, um, has some features that are primarily focused on making it for that scenario where somebody has taken over your UID1 account or has taken over an admin account on your site. It limits what they can do inside of your site. Um, so things like blocking the ability to execute PHP, blocking their ability to even disable the Paranoia module itself, um, blocking their ability to change email address on the user one account, change the, the password on the user one account, things like that. Um, the security review module, that's what I was mentioning with text formats. So it will look at all of your text formats on your site and say, hey, you're allowing anonymous users to input script tags or to input iframes. Um, and you know, you just wanted the video player to work, right? You wanted embedding uh, YouTube videos to work, and so you allowed iframes, because that seemed like it was the way to do it. Um, but it turns out that allowing iframes for untrusted users is a, an avenue for a cross-site scripting attack. Um, so security review helps with, act, with text formats and with a lot of other sort of common misconfigurations on Drupal sites. It doesn't change anything the way that Paranoia does. It just makes recommendations and provides help text and links to where you can actually make changes. Um, the permissions lock module. So the idea here is that you, you shouldn't, like certain, there's this concept in Drupal of like, yeah, you can configure things in the interface and, and yeah, that's very dynamic and makes it easy to change what, the way that your site behaves. Um, but maybe more and more of that should be put into uh, code. So take the configuration out of the web browser interface and put it into code that is then deployed along with um, you know, whatever your deployment process is. So permissions lock basically disables the permissions page in Drupal and requires you to, uh, to move, that, move the permissions through code rather than through pointing and clicking. Um, and the idea there is again, like what if an account gets compromised, what can that person do? By allowing them to change permissions, um, it makes it easier for them to uh, take over your site and do really malicious things. Uh, it also makes sure that whatever change you make is really, really intentional. That you don't just have a mistake with a couple checkboxes that ends up opening up your site. Um, so how about two-factor authentication? Is everybody, everybody's probably using that, right? Yeah? Most everybody? And you love it. It's the best thing ever. It's so fun to enter in numbers. Um, so, uh, or maybe you have like a really fancy, like a CAC key, I think is what some people use. Yeah, a couple folks using that. Um, so that's a little faster maybe than, than typing in those random numbers. Um, there is a two-factor authentication module for Drupal. Um, anybody using that? No? It's got like five users. Um, I'm one of them, uh, so, <laughs> but it's, it's used by Acquia, it's used by, you know, uh, as I mentioned, card.com. Um, I'm sorry, Greg, what was that one called? Two-factor two authentication. Oh, it's factor authentication. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's just, you know, the idea is like, we can't really trust people to have good passwords that are not something that can be brute forced, right, or, or sniffed or whatever. Um, and so two-factor authentication um, adds another layer to that authentication process to make sure that it's really, really going to be secure. It is a, a pluggable module, so right now there are tools for using um, the TOTP style of password, which is what Google Authenticator uses if you've used that. Um, but it can be, oh, it also has, I think, SMS and email as a way of communicating the token. Um, but you can extend it to do other things. So if you, you have a CAC uh, key that you use, then you can use that, um, or, or potentially other things. Um, so another module, Hacked, uh, I think is like, not a great name, um, but, but basically what it does is it looks at all of your modules, all of your contributed modules, it looks at core, and it tries to figure out have any of these things been changed. Um, and this is sort of a common problem that we see, not necessarily in Drupal, but often in third-party code running on, on the same server that, is, that allows for file upload or file modification through you know, some sort of a web interface, is that, that that is then used as an avenue for modifying, and it's usually the index.php that gets modified. Um, so hacked is just one way to verify that none of your stuff has been modified from what's available on Drupal.org. There are other ways to do that, obviously. You know, if you're using uh, some sort of a revision control system like Git for your deployments, then you can just say like, hey, what's Git, you know, give me Git status and put that into uh, an automated job that emails you if there's ever a change on your server compared to what Git thinks it should be. Um, so password policy module, um, everybody's favorite, right? Like capital P, password one. Um, th that's, you know, how many people have an environment where you have password policies on your sites, right? Most people. Um, so I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of not excited about that. Um, it's there if you need it. I understand that, you know, a lot of certifications really require you to have specific password policy rules. Um, what I think is uh, a, a better approach is this relatively new module, password strength two. Um, so it's based on the idea that 
you know, capital P password one with a one on the end is not actually a good password, but it, it meets a lot of the minimum criteria that are specified for people. Um, and so that is the most common password in use in the world today. Um, the, the idea with password strength uh, or password strength two is that you work on the entropy of the word and whether or not that word or the passphrase, password, whatever you want to call it, um, and whether or not there's enough entropy there to actually be secure to make it hard to brute force. So it looks for whether the words are in a dictionary, um, whether you have uh, strings that are you know, repeating characters, different things like that to determine the entropy of the string, and then it decides whether or not the password is strong enough. I think that that's sort of a, a, a much, you know, that and two-factor authentication feel to me like much better approaches to password security. Um, but, you know, you have to do what, what meets criteria and then maybe what also makes sense to you for uh, security, right? Um, what, what about you guys? Are there any other modules that I missed that you think are good ones that are necessary? My site's like wide open to the world, so we don't have people log in. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What about you guys at LTR? Do you guys have researchers that log in? Very few. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very last because you, you trust your admins to have good passwords, so you, you're lax about that concept. Yeah. Um, what uh, steps to get rid of uh, um, for the PHP and for the authority of LLC on Facebook? Yeah. But it wouldn't, I mean, from my, I mean, the case that you put, like, you lose the computer and then let somebody come and pass it to a But that's just unlikely. So anyway, we did away with the PHP. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just curiosity, are we naive to think that like, so for our eight people that log in to add content to a Google site that we should actually, I mean, can you maybe just speak to that question? Sure. Right there? Cause I mean, I don't know. I'm just the one Drupal developer at our spot. And so there's so much pressure just to get stuff done that right. it's like dealing with these types of issues is so on the low burner cause they're like, well, why can't I add my data? Go and do that first. So if you could just- right. Yeah, um, and, and would it be useful to repeat the questions for or repeat comments um, for folks on the phone? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, there was just a question about whether it's important to actually, uh, to, to follow some of these rules if you have a relatively small number of people logging into the site. And, and so I've seen, um, I've seen a couple of strategies for uh, related to security in an environment where you have a small number of people logging into a site. One of them um, is that you have like two different interfaces to the Drupal site and in the public interface that is available over the public internet you allow your at the MySQL level you will allow that user to have the ability to read basically all of the tables um, and only write to specific tables there's a handful of tables like the watchdog table if you're using that um, statistics table if you're using that a couple of other things that even in a quote-unquote read-only site still need to be written to by the database user um, but other than that you can lock it down so that like the node table can't be written to or the users table for example can't be written to um, and then you have a separate in a installation of Drupal that is only accessible over a VPN where those are or only accessible inside of your firewall and where those eight people can log in and manage the actual site and when they make changes they're published instantly because it's talking to the same database but it's using database credentials that have rewrite permissions um, I mean to your point about like is that worth your time um, or, or are these things worth spending time on? From my perspective, I, I would add, you know, personally paranoia and security review on every single site. Um, I think that those are valuable to anyone um, regardless of what your scenario is. And, and I think it's the kind of thing where if you just start with it that way, then you don't have this like cleanup effort of going back to get rid of PHP and node bodies. Um, you, don't, you don't have a lot of problems down the road. Um, security review has a, a Drush interface um, so that you can, you know, again, automate a job and have it look for problems and then email you if there's ever a problem. Um, and and I, I love those kinds of things where, you know, you can automate as much as possible because, as you say, you have other priorities. You have people, you know, who really want to get their data online and they're, they're not going to, like, give you 15 minutes to go look at the security review report every week or whatever, right? So if you can just automate it, that's great. It takes care of it for you. Um, you know, permissions lock, it probably depends upon... Um, I don't know. I've seen a lot of really talented developers make mistakes, right? We all get busy, we're under deadlines, and we just want to enable something and we make mistakes. Um, so a lot of these things I still like because they make it harder to make mistakes, basically. Um, and that's what, in my experience, 
where I see the most security vulnerabilities is people who are who are rushed, people who are pushed beyond their training, people who are um, you know learning something new, and they they just don't have the time to actually put into security. So the more that you can um, make it easy for them to get things right, the better. Yeah. Um, has anybody hosted outside of their organization? <laughs> no. Oh, yes. Okay, cool. Um, great. So there is one person that this is relevant to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, in your, you know, this is useful depending upon who you are, right? Um, if you have a team of sysadmins who have their exact way that they like to configure servers, then, um, you know, I, I, would, I would use the commercially available Drupal hosting to kind of push them along to give you features that make your life better. Um, there are a lot of great solutions out there. I, I listed, you know, just Pantheon and Acquia Cloud specifically because I think that they have features that make uh, your life easier to be secure as a system administrator um, or a, as a Drupal site administrator. So Pantheon has a really nice feature for providing new Drupal updates. It's basically, if you've, ever, if you've never seen it, it's just like a one-click operation. You log into their platform and you say, oh, there's a new version of Drupal Core. Yes, I would like that. Um, it, it puts it into the testing environment. Uh, you can try it out in the testing environment, and then you say promote to live. That's great, right? I mean, it, I wish that that worked, you know, all software worked that way for web software. Um, Acquia Cloud uh, also has, you know, they've got a lot of great features, and I think the, the most relevant one for security is their insight tool. So this is something that you just sort of, you, you don't have to be on Acquia Cloud to get the insight tool, uh, but if you were on Acquia Cloud, then you get it as part of that package. Um, and one of the things that insight provides is, is a lot of, uh, security checks, similar to security review, but it has a couple more than that, where it just looks for common misconfigurations inside of your site, basically. Um, so those are just two like really focused security-specific things about those two hosting companies. There's a lot of other great hosting companies as well, um, but I don't, you know, listed at triple.org/host. I don't think that they're quite as that they have as many features that are helpful for security reasons. Um, both of those, you know, Pantheon and Acquia and many of the other hosting companies have other things that they do for, um, like, the way that your code is managed, you know, forcing it to be through a revision control system, I think, is really helpful for security to make sure that things haven't been changed inappropriately. Um, the way that they handle the uh, credentials for the database, I think, is really nice that it sort of gets in, um, divined from the environment um, so that... You know, you don't have to have that uh, in a settings.php file that you're managing that may or may not accidentally get committed to Git um, on GitHub or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of things like that that can be helpful. Uh, another thing, you know, I mentioned the pain, basically, of updating your modules. And, and you know, for different people, it's more or less of a pain. But um, if you find that that is a stumbling block, I think that that's one of the most important things that you can do to make sure that your Drupal site is safe is just keep all of your code up to date with what's available on Drupal.org. Um, so Acquia provides a service called uh, Remote Administration where they have people who will sort of take care of that for you whenever a new version of Drupal Core or a contributed module is available. You know, Pantheon's solution to that, as I mentioned, is more automated, and I think that's only for Core. I don't think that Pantheon's system works with Contrib. Um, but, you know, you, it's something that you need to figure out how you're going to manage um, and then just make sure that you stay on top of it. Um, so... I guess that pretty much everybody here cares about FedRAMP and FISMA, yeah? And you love it? Um, I think that, uh, or, or not so much, maybe it doesn't affect everybody's sites. Um, but, uh, you know, basically my point is that you need to know what regulations apply to you and then make sure that you're following them. Um, make, make sure that, you know, you, you s stick to both, you know, like you're sticking with the spirit of those, of those guidelines. They are, I think, mostly rooted in trying to make sites more secure. Um, it can feel like just sort of a bureaucratic pain sometimes, but um, I think there's a lot of really great ideas inside of those standards. Um, so it's, it's good to work on those things. Um, and, uh, you know, related to that, I know that um, Acquia has achieved some level of um, certification and accreditation on at least one or two of those. Um, I don't know of any other hosting providers that have actually achieved that. Um, so if you're looking for, if you're in that, if you're in an environment that requires that, then you know Acquia is a pretty good choice. Um, so as I mentioned, security is you know not just a project. It's not something that you just do once. It's a process that you gotta you know automate as much as you can, but make sure that you're staying on top of it. 
Um, and I think, you know, my, my sense is that you have to budget for security um, in proportion to how important it is inside of your project, right? So if you're dealing with 100% open data, um, there's still probably some private information inside of your site, like the, the passwords. Um, some people consider their IP address to be private, um, and IP addresses are logged pretty frequently by Drupal. Um, so, you know, you, you do have to um, maintain some level of security around even the most basic site, regardless of how open the data is. Um, and, you know, part of that is the role that the Drupal.org uh, infrastructure plays in this, right? So we've got the update status module um, that I'll, I'll look at a little bit more that can help you to stay up to date. Um, pardon me, I need a little water. Um, so how many people are familiar with the Drupal security team and that concept that they exist, that they're out there? Yeah? Um, uh, I think, yeah, pretty big. I think it's like 40 people, actually. Um, mostly concentrated in, in the United States, um, or, or at least North America, um, although there are a handful of people in Europe, um, and I'm probably forgetting one or two locations of really valuable contributors, but um, yeah, most, mostly concentrated in North America. Um, so it is about 40 people, all volunteers, you know, uh, people who do it somewhat related to their day jobs to some extent, often. Um, and uh, the idea is not necessarily that the security team is like looking at code to find vulnerabilities and fix them, but they're just sort of facilitating a process where independent researchers, um, who may be members of the security team as well, um, but an independent researcher reports an issue and it comes into the team. The team coordinates with the module maintainer, with the theme maintainer, whoever it might be, to get a fix and then get that fix published out to the world uh, as quickly as possible, but also in a managed way so that it's not just coming out sort of randomly. Um, so you may have noticed that all the releases are on Wednesdays, right? Um, so end of the day Wednesday, plan like a half an hour just in case maybe. Um, it's, it's, we try to get them out by about noon Eastern time, but uh, it seems like it, they slip later and later um, depending upon who the maintainer is. Um, we also you know, try to do education. So at just about every Drupal camp or, or DrupalCon, um, at you know, even events like this, we you know, consider this to be part of our role is, is outreach to Drupal site builders, developers, the community to help people understand how to keep their sites secure. Um, and then we, as, as it says, you know, we facilitate the process of a security advisory for every security release. And the security advisory is just the thing that triggers the email, it triggers the update status notification inside of your sites, um, it triggers Twitter alerts, and it even goes out to a couple of other sort of meta security distribution lists. Um, we also are pretty much always accepting new members. Um, so if that's an area of focus for you, I can say that it's been one of the most rewarding things in my time working on Drupal. Um, it's you know, 40 people, but uh, really passionate and uh, intelligent, hardworking folks um, that are, are very giving of their knowledge. So um, if, even if you're not like a security expert, the most important thing is to just be detail oriented and have some time. Um, so if you want to learn more about security, it's a great way to do that. Um, this is a really great uh, infographic that was created by uh, Acquia and um, Joseph Toth of Moog Design. Um, it's, a, it's just about that process I was describing of an issue getting reported, going through the process of getting patched and then getting released out to the world. Um, it's uh, pretty nice if you're trying to understand what that is or trying to communicate it to somebody else who's um, feeling confused by it. Um, so here's the OWASP top 10, um, which I think a lot of people use when they try to understand what are the most important issues in security. These are the, the 10 most important issues that OWASP, the Open Web and Application Security Project, uh, thinks are, you know, this is the big deal right now. Um, and injection includes both remote code execution and SQL injection, um, and then a bunch of other things. Uh, what I think is important to consider when you're looking at this is, you know, they're thinking about the whole world of web and application security, right? Um, but we're, you know, for purposes of this talk anyway, mostly focused on what matters to Drupal. Um, so here's uh, st some statistics that go from 2005 to September of 2013, looking at what are the most common vulnerabilities in Drupal. So we see cross-site scripting, or XSS, is the biggest one by a long shot. Uh, access bypass is next, and then cross-site request forgeries, SQL injection, um, arbitrary code execution, and then that, that friendly bucket of other. Um, basically a bunch of things that, you know, happen so infrequently that um, they had to get grouped together. 
I think it's a little bit more interesting to look at that from the perspective of what percent of issues are each of those things over the course of time. Um, so this is broken down by year. And what you can see is um, that green that's about 50%, or maybe it's exactly 50% on the left, was SQL injection. Uh, and then up through September of 2013, we had basically no SQL injection issues for the year 2013. And you can see how it's, it really tapered off. So I think my sense of what happened there is that, you know, if, you, if you're optimistic, what you would say is that Drupal's database API makes it so easy to avoid or so hard to create SQL injection vulnerabilities that people just don't do it. Um, if you're pessimistic, you could say, well, it's just that XSS became so popular um, that people were making so many mistakes that it drowned out the noise of SQL injection. Um, so I, I'm optimistic about that. I think Drupal's database API is really good um, and really helpful on this front. It's also interesting to see, like, cross-site request forgeries, uh, you know, that there weren't any identified before 2006. I think that's when the concept really became sort of popular for people to exploit. Um, and, 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 the, and therefore for people to have to protect against. I think that's also when sort of the rise of Ajax um, and cross-site request forgeries commonly are created in Ajax requests. Um, and then access bypass is just a really growing issue that we've got. And I'll get into what I think are some of the architectural level reasons for why that's a problem. Um, so I want to start with cross-site request forgeries, uh, even though it's the third most common of the three vulnerabilities I'm going to talk about today. Um, basically, it's some sort of a path that accepts parameters, get parameters, post parameters, whatever, and then takes an action uh, based upon that request without confirming that you actually intended to take that action. Um, and this is a problem basically because browsers just always send the session cookie. So, um, you know, at the beginning of, uh, or, or during the introduction this morning, Adam put up a slide with, or a couple slides with short URLs on it, on it, right? And you just sort of, you're like, oh, well, I guess I trust Adam that that short URL is a good, you know, has a good destination on the other end of it. But what if it didn't? Um, what if it pointed to a URL that was on, you know, some site where you're logged into that took an action, um, you know, without confirming your intent? Uh, you would have all just, for example, voted for Adam's design on Etsy or something like that, right? Um, if that were a, f a flaw in Etsy. I'm not saying it is. Um, but uh, that's just an example of how CSRF works, or one way that you can exploit CSRF. There's a lot of ways to do it, um, and, and I'll show an example in a second. But that's basically the idea is that, you know, you don't know where your cookies are going to ultimately end up, but they're always, your session cookie is always going to be sent for requests to a domain. Um, and, it, and that you can't trust just the existence of a session cookie in order to confirm that the person actually intends to take a particular action. Um, so when I'm looking at either code or a website and trying to identify a cross-site request forgery, uh, looking at code specifically, I look for these um, dollar underscore get and dollar underscore post PHP super global variables. Um, when people are accessing those, it's usually an indication that they're not quite sure how to do stuff in Drupal. Um, not always, but often. Um, and so it's like, it's a little spidey sense that goes off for me um, that says, hey, there's, there's probably a vulnerability here. Um, and so I look at how those variables are used and whether there's any validation of the person's intent. Another way to, to do, um, to look for this is to look for um, what I call verb menu callbacks or some sort of an action menu callback in Drupal. So if you see a path like um, node slash delete slash and then it takes an argument for whatever node to delete. Again, that should set off a, a, a warning for you. And it's worth investigating that callback to see if there's any sort of confirmation of intent. Um, and then, you know, also I'll just do it by like clicking on a link and seeing that it takes an action and thinking, boy, I wonder if they're actually, you know, looking at some sort of a token to confirm that I intended to take that action. Uh, and like I said, Ajax operations are, you know, just very, very frequently um, a source of CSRF vulnerabilities. Um, so how do we fix cross-site request forgeries? Well, one, one thing is to just use the form API. Um, back in 2006 or so, uh, the form API in Drupal was sort of a, a created, um, but then also amended to include uh, the ability or the, the default checking of a person's intent. Um, and I'll get into what I mean by intent in a second. Um, but uh, it, it includes a form token that includes information that is unique to them, to their session, to the site that you're on, and to the action being taken. And by including a token that, that is a hash of all three of those things, you can confirm that the person was actually intending to do whatever is at that, uh, whatever's at that point. Um, so the form API is one of the easiest ways to avoid cross-site request forgeries. As long as you're using it properly, you will avoid 
cross-site request forgeries. If you're building some sort of an AJAX callback and you're not using the form API, if you're building, if you're you know just using a link for some sort of an action, um, then you need to be sure to include a token um, by yourself that will confirm the person's intent. Um, and there's some more information on DrupalScout.com at a tag for CSRF. Um, and let's take a look at it real quick. Um, Man, those colors are really freaking me out. Does that look weird to you? Um, OK, so I have just sort of a very basic Drupal 7 installation here. Um, and I'm, I'm logged in in Chrome as an admin user. Um, and uh, there is an article um, on this post. And if we click through on it, we see the comments are enabled, right? OK, so no big deal. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, oops. So I'm going to go to that in Chrome. Um, so now it's, uh, oh, and I'll be sure to log out first. And what we can see, so now I'm, I'm in a, my attacker mode. Um, and I'm here to cause havoc on this site. So the way that I'm going to, you know, as I mentioned, you can use a short URL as one way to exploit a cross-site request forgery. Um, I'm going to use an image tag, and the uh, the particular how's that? Pretty small in the back, or okay? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, the URL that I'm going to take advantage of is the logout URL. Um, so not as dangerous as the idea of deleting a node or something like that, but this is a, a CSRF vulnerability that you can demonstrate pretty easily in Drupal. Um, it's, it's uh, considered to be like a low priority vulnerability just because there's no real damage done other than some annoyance. Um, but uh, it is to, you know, by sort of classical definition of cross-site request forgeries, it is, uh, you know, you can consider it to be a CSRF vulnerability. So, you know, I just created this image and obviously my browser says it's, you know, displaying this little broken image tag to me. It's saying, hey, there's not actually an image at that URL. Um, but if we look at, I, I just popped open the Chrome developer tools here, and if we look at what's going on inside of my browser, um, let's see, where is it? Yeah, so there's this request that's happening for that quote unquote image of logout, right? And if you look at the request headers, uh, you'll see that it's sending along my cookies to that page. So I'll go back to Firefox, uh, to lovely green Firefox, where I'm an admin. I'm logged in, and you know, what do I do when I wake up in the morning? Um, I go to my site and I say, oh, are there any new comments? Yay, somebody commented on my article. I'm so excited that I've getting, get, got engagement. Um, and then I click on it, and I say, oh, that's weird. There's a broken image in there. Now I think I'll try to uh, edit this comment to make it better. And it's access denied, right? Um, because when, that, when there was that request for that image, it made the request to log out on my behalf. And Drupal didn't verify that I actually intended to go to that URL. Um, so that's how, that's sort of the classic case of what a CSRF vulnerability looks like. Um, you know, again, this one, just annoying. Um, doesn't, doesn't break my site particularly. Uh, there was one a couple of years ago. Um, I, I tried to find one on Drupal 7 that I could demonstrate from the recent past, but there, there weren't any that were. Um, easy to demonstrate and like straight, as straightforward as this. Um, but there was one a couple years ago that allowed you to, I think, unpublish every single menu item in Drupal. So that's a little bit more annoying. Um, like if you have an e-commerce site and the link to checkout goes away or, uh, you know, right? Like that, that could cost you a lot of money um, if that happened. Um, so now I've got to recover from this. Uh, I don't know why I put it at the beginning. <laughs> um, So, okay, now I know. There's something weird going on with that and with that comment. So I'm just going to get rid of it. Alrighty. Any questions about CSRF or how those work? So aside from filtering out the image tag and comments, are you going to maybe go into a little bit about how to protect yourself from Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of glossed over that. It's okay. Um, so, uh, fixing, so I, I talked about the idea of sending and validating tokens. Um, well, 
pardon me. So for the, the user logout scenario, exactly, there actually is a module that protects that callback with a with a token, um, and then it updates. Uh, it adds a link and show, shows you how to create a link to that, so that it will continue. So that the logout link in your theme or in your menu will continue to work. Um, in general, though, the solution is you know in much more depth in a tutorial on this DrupalScout.com link. Um, and it's basically that you know either either you're using the form API which has those tokens for you, or you use two different functions: uh, Drupal get token, and I think it's Drupal valid token. Uh, I'm not sure if it's valid or validate, but um, those two functions in pair. So when you're creating the link, you use Drupal get token to add on uh, a new parameter for this form token that that includes something um, specific to the site, which is added by default by that function to the session, again, added by default by the function, and then something specific to the action. So if in my example of node slash delete, um, you would want to make the item unique to the function like node delete and then the node ID that's going to be deleted so that the same CSRF token can't be used on multiple uh, requests to avoid basically a replay attack. Um, so that's, um, I don't, I, I, that's sort of like the, the very quick version of it and then there's more details there. Um, yeah, any other questions about CSRF? Feels good, okay. That's the easy one. <laughs> so cross-site scripting, um, it's basically like 50% of the vulnerabilities in Drupal are cross-site scripting. And I think that, um, I don't really have a good sense of, <laughs> of why that is, um, but it is. Um, so cross-site scripting is basically, it's, it's some sort of code in your browser um, people often talk about it in terms of JavaScript, although it doesn't have to be JavaScript. It can also be a Java applet or a, a Flash widget or whatever. Um, but usually JavaScript is, you know, the way that it's exploited. And uh, actually, uh, PDF as well has some features of cross-site scripting. So there's a lot of different ways that um, you can get, quote unquote, code in the browser to be taking actions on your behalf. Um, it's making requests to the site. It's parsing the responses. And uh, you know the, the thing that's significant about parsing the responses is that it can bypass the CSRF problem. Um, so it can get your CSRF token and then use that to submit a form. Um, so that's how cross-site scripting is particularly damaging. Um, this may sound familiar to you, right? Like this is just Ajax. This is how Ajax works. So you know, as, as a site builder, you're using Ajax to create a nice user experience. As an attacker, you're using XSS to you know, execute a whole bunch of actions on behalf of whoever's browser you happen to have tricked into landing on that uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. The two ways that um, I like to test for cross-site scripting are to just use these uh, little snippets of JavaScript. And the first one works as long as it's valid to actually input all of those characters into wh wherever you're, you're sending it. Um, the one that can be a little bit tricky is like the forward slash uh, is not always allowed. Um, or you know, sometimes some, of, some characters are just excluded from an input field where you're testing for cross-site scripting. Um, so that's where the second one comes into play, that, that image tag. And it's looking for an image like A that doesn't exist, right? Um, or you know you can use any other image name that you want, but the idea is that you know you're just uh, you're putting a pop-up into basically an alert box or a pop-up into the into the page, in order to identify places where there's no filtering to exclude JavaScript. Uh, one thing that I like to do is use. You see here that I've got the word title inside of that. For you know for purposes of testing a site, I will often use the name of the field where I input that script as my pop-up so that then when I'm browsing around the site, you know, maybe it's a block somewhere else where I actually get to execute the JavaScript and it, I, I you know, stumble upon that 20 clicks later on the site. Um, so by, by saying you know, blog hyphen title, I know that it was a blog title that provides the input that ultimately is not being escaped. Um, that can be uh, very helpful. So this, as I say, catches you know ninety percent in my very scientific, highly rigorous um, you know survey of of what is possible. Um, there's as I said, other ways. Flash is another one that's that's um, you can get through Flash, Java, um, PDF files even. But if you're filtering in in Drupal in ways that block out these, then you're probably going to be okay. Um, there are some other tags that are uh, or some other techniques you can use. There's, I think, html5sec.org, which I, I didn't put in these slides, but I should, has like hundreds of examples of what you can do to get uh, JavaScript executing inside of a browser. Um, and you know, people keep on coming up with new ones. The other thing that's tricky about this is that it depends upon your browser. So um, 
Chrome and I think Safari have some protections so that if you have a URL that includes JavaScript in it, it won't actually execute that. So when you're when you're testing a site, it's important to use um, Firefox realistically, um, or you know, there's certain like browser-specific things basically that you have to be aware of. Um, so how do we fix XSS? Uh, a lot of people will sort of jump to the conclusion that you want to fix it by not allowing script in any inputs. Um, and the problem with that is like, what if you have a site that's about discussing JavaScript? Um, or like, <laughs> what, if, what if that's an appropriate input for some reason on your site? So the, 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 the best way to solve it in my mind is that you're filtering the text on output in a way that makes sense for whatever place it's being output into. This is sort of a general rule. Um, and you want to do it sort of as late as possible. If you do it during input and you know, somebody had a, a mistake in their script tag, you might accidentally delete all of their content before you insert it into the database, right? So you want to do this as late as possible. Store their information as they input it, and then filter it in a way that gets rid of uh, XSS attacks right before you insert it into somebody's browser, right, right before you print it out into their browser. Um, another thing is that, you know, this is the idea like a framework can really help you. There are a lot of APIs in Drupal that actually take care of this for you. So Drupal 7, the Drupal set title command will actually do filtering by default. Um, if you're using the translation API, the T function, it will do that filtering by default as long as you're using the at or percent sign placeholders. Um, so <clears throat> how about somebody just makes me a handy dandy flowchart. Um, so the idea here is that you start up at the top left um, and sort of work your way down through what kind of data do you have. If you have a URL, you can use the check URL function on it. That's actually included inside of the L function. So if you're using the L function to output an, a URL, then you're already doing that sort of outputting. Um, if you have quote unquote plain text, which an example of that might be a node title, um, it might be uh, you know some text that you want to um, What's an example of plain text? It doesn't have code in it, basically. You don't want to allow any sort of styling. Then check plain will take like the less than and turn it into an ampersand LT semicolon. It'll do things like that so that the text will be rendered inside of the person's browser as, um, as actual text. If you have rich text, that's, I think, a little bit tricky because Drupal has its own concept of rich, rich text. And this is basically a node body, a comment, anywhere where you have uh, the, the combination of input uh, input field and a format associated with that. So the plain text, filtered HTML, full HTML, that's the input or the text format that's associated with the node body. And so check markup takes two arguments. It takes the field, the node body, and then also whatever the format is that's associated with it. Um, the next one is if you have some HTML. So an example of this might be um, you, you have a module that allows you to like put in a message that's going to show up at the top of your page as a warning to everybody. And you want them to be, do, be able to do a little bit of styling, um, but not a ton of styling. You can use filter XSS to allow through a handful of HTML tags. Um, it's also somewhat configurable. So if you say, well, you know, in that block, I only want people to be able to input list items, uh, links, and italics. You can say those specific tags and filter XSS will get rid of everything else. Um, and then if you have something that's trusted, then you can just print it straight out without doing any filtering on it. Uh, in general, you do not have trusted text, right? Um, trusted text is something like uh, the Google Analytics module has a place where you can input JavaScript. And it's only accessible to people who have a very advanced permission on your site. And so you can consider that to be trusted because if you filtered out JavaScript, then that field would no longer serve its purpose. Um, but you know, use that really carefully and make sure that the text that you're outputting is definitely, definitely input by somebody who can be 100% trusted. Um, so let's take a look at XSS. Uh, that's not what I want to do. Get out of full screen. OK, so once again, I'm in Chrome, being my usual malicious self. I'm going to go back to this fun article. And I'll just input this uh, little bit of JavaScript. And anybody have any idea why this is going to execute? What my mistake was in configuring my site? It's the fact that as an anonymous user, I've got the permission to use the full HTML text format, right? Um, so I'm going to click Save here. 
And you can see how by entering both the, you know, the alert with the word comment title in it and then comment body, I see comment body is popping up at me, but not, um, not the title, right? So one of those fields is being filtered properly, one of them isn't. Um, and and uh, you know, here's an example where it was output by a check plane, and, and therefore you're actually seeing all of that text rendered as text inside of the browser. Um, so an alert you know, probably isn't that scary, right? If I go back to Firefox and I'm logged in as an admin and I see an alert, right? Big deal, right? That's annoying, um, but, but it's not, it's not going to stress me out. I'm not going to lose my job over that. Um, so here, here is some JavaScript, and um, it's available on GitHub if you search for it. Um, but what this does, I mentioned the idea that the real problem with cross-site scripting, the fact that it can parse the responses and use that, uh, this JavaScript is grabbing the form token, the CSRF form token, out of the user number two form on the site, and then using that CSRF token to then submit with uh, a new password for user number two. Um, and so this is an example of what cross-site scripting can do. Anything, and, and in order to get this to actually run, you have to trick somebody who is an admin on the site, in order, uh, trick them into landing on a page on the site that includes this JavaScript inside of it. So, you know, a couple preconditions there, but it's not that hard to get somebody to land on that page, right? Like, we talked about the idea of using a, a URL shortener, or in, in this case of having cross-site scripting inside of a comment, you could post a comment that had, like, a really racy title in it, um, and down at the bottom of it is your JavaScript, and so the admins are all going to click on that because they want to delete it and moderate it quickly. Um, and now they've just executed all of this JavaScript. All right. Um, any questions about cross-site scripting? Real quick, where can we find yeah. that code? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, it's, it's in a gist um, that, that's got my username on it, um, but I can also post a link, um, or, or remind me and I'll, I'll be sure to get a link to you guys, yeah. Okay, cross-site scripting. It's just, it just makes so much sense to everybody, right? Um, I feel like it's the most complex vulnerability that we, that we deal with in Drupal. Um, but if you can break it down to just those simple examples of an alert box using either the script or the image tag, you, you'll catch, as I said, 90% of it. You'll catch most of it, um, and you'll be safe. And, and really, the, um, as a developer or a themer where I use that information, is I, I'm like about to print out a variable or about to add a variable into my render array, and I'm saying, man, what kind of filtering should I be doing on this? Um, and I'll just use those two different scripts to, um, or those two different uh, bits of HTML in order to figure out what kind of filtering is going to make sure that my site's safe. Okay, so access bypass is, as I mentioned, a really growing area in Drupal, um, or at least it's growing in terms of how common it is relative to other things. Uh, and it's really just the idea that you can either see or do something on a site that your permissions or access should prevent you from doing. Pretty, pretty straightforward description, right? Um, and it, en it encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, is anybody using like the node access module or field access, entity access, anything like that to keep things um, hidden from some logged in users and not others? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so that's like, that's one area, one out of the maybe five different kinds of access bypass that we have in Drupal. And I think that's what makes it so tricky is like where do we actually, um, you know, create and enforce our control of people's access. So it might be in the views configuration, um, permissions, it's in the access callback on your, in your code for menu items. Um, it might be you know, using the user underscore access function. There's, as I said, node access, entity access, field access, all of those different access systems um, that you have to keep in mind. And then you know, if you have services module, REST, REST module, REST WS module, anything like that. And then in the theme layer as well. Um, so there's just all of these different places where you know, it might be right, it might be necessary to enforce access on your site. And I think that's what makes it so hard to get it right, is that um, it's hard to make sure that you've got all of those things working properly together. Um, so when I'm looking for or testing access for access bypass, uh, you know, simple one, right? Like if you're logged out and you go to a path for an unpublished node, can you see it? Um, that, that should not work, but it's possible to configure that in the permissions if you do. Um, you visit some sort of a URL and you might see, like this was uh, the AT&T 
uh, hack that they had for iPads a while ago um, that got a lot of attention in, I think, Gawker, um, because somebody figured out that you go to a particular URL and you put in your account number and you can see your account information. You put in somebody else's account number, you see their account information, um, right? So that's exciting. Uh, that's that's a, a problem that uh, it's it's very easy to create as a web developer, unfortunately. Um, and so you know you just have to make sure, as a tester or as a developer, make sure that you're validating those inputs um, because it's entirely up to the person entering that information whether they put in their own account information or another person's. Um, another example is looking at listings of content. So home page is a list of content. If you have a table, it's a list of content. Anything that should be private. Um, you know, you have to try it out with different roles, with the anonymous role, with certain authenticated roles, make sure that people are only seeing the content that they should be able to see. And I think that this, more so than some of the others, it lends itself to automated testing. Um, so is anybody, anybody using Behat? No? Not so much? Um, the thing that I think is really cool, I'll just do a quick plug, um, that I think is really cool about Behat is that it uses sort of natural language to describe what's happening. So you, you can just say, um, given I go to node slash seven, then I should get a 404 or a 403, right? And that, that's almost literally a Behat test. Um, if you put that into, you know, that getting the environment set up for running Behat tests is not um, t too difficult. And you just write those two lines inside of a text file and boom, it runs the test. Um, so it's something that, you know, I, I had an aha moment when I wanted to test a coworker's code and it was faster for me to write the Behat test than actually click through the browser. Um, so I think that, you know, if you, have, if you have like a page where you never, ever, ever want to see an unpublished node show up on that page, just have an automated test that's looking for that. Um, so how do we fix it? Uh, it really depends upon a lot of different things. And... Um, you know, that there's uh, at the SQL layer, you have to add a tag if you're building up a query using Drupal's database API. Um, you know, look at your menu definitions, use the different access functions wherever it's necessary. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you might need to, a lot of different parts of Drupal's API that you might need to use to fix an access bypass issue. All right, so a quick demo. Um, so I have on this very exciting site. A tool for um, inviting people to the site and basically giving them it gives them like a, a six digit code that they need to use in order to actually authentic or like create their account and get onto the site. So um, put in an email address right. And I invite my good friend Greg to come. And here's all the other people that have been invited to join this site. And you can imagine, like, it's an input box where you're meant to put in hundreds or thousands of emails. So you can imagine that this list would eventually not just be four. It would be a lot of, a lot of email addresses um, that are inside of here. And, um, you know, th this example site is, is site install. I don't know what it's about. But, um, you know, depending upon the nature of your site, it may be sensitive who is or is not a member of the site or who is or has or has not had um, an invitation to it. So the, the access bypass vulnerability, this is one that was published, I think it's 2013-093, uh, um, published last fall, um, is that if I go to this URL, you can see as an anonymous user, I'm given the login block over here in Chrome because I'm not logged in. Um, as an anonymous user, I can see all of the email addresses and their invite code and their request code, whatever that may or may not do. Um, so I can see all this inf information, and it's because the views configuration didn't include a check for the right permissions um, before displaying this information. So this is just one example of, a, uh, you know, how you can introduce a, an access bypass vulnerability into the site. In this case, the way to solve that is, you know, just changing your views configuration. Um, this was the default view that came with the module, and it didn't have that, uh, that check for access inside of it. Um, but Clearly, clearly it should. Um, so, any any questions on access bypass? Yeah. Um, sometimes you see uh, like, uh, hashes used in URLs where uh, you want to kind of make a certain URL private. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So the the question was about using a like a hash in a URL. 
um, in, order to, in order to provide some level of access control without requiring people to log in and whether that's secure. I think that you know, as a generic strategy, sure, that's, that's definitely secure. Um, I, there's um, a gentleman, Heine Delstra, who uh, was the triple security team lead um, for, for like five years, a pretty amazing amount of time. Um, he, he wrote a module to do that that he uses on his own site. Um, so if you're looking to do that in Drupal, I would say that's one that's probably written pretty well. Um, and I think as a strategy, it can be good. It, it all, the, you know, the, the details are where it really matters, whether it's done properly or not. Um, and you know, even Drupal Core does something like that with the uh, password reset URLs, right? It's got a, a hash of different bits of information um, that authenticates that you're really that person who has that email address. Yeah? I just wonder if there's a, a place where it collects like the Drupal Security Darwin Award. Just the things that people have done. Just, you know, things, mistakes people have made to learn from. Is there a I think, I think that there is. Um, let's see. So, so um, this is a, a little trick um, that people may have seen or may have done themselves in the past. Um, there's, if you have the PHP filter module enabled, and if you have it available to anonymous, two things that I really recommend you don't do, um, <laughs> then Google will index it for you, right? Um, so there you go. These are places where you can enter. I, I may have gotten the string wrong because it doesn't look quite right, but um, you know it's something like this, and you can just search for it. So here's uh, here's the Darwin Awards for Drupal. Um, another another fun one. Um, let's see if it. What is it? Admin invitation. So this is another trick that you can use. Um, doesn't look like it found any. It, it wasn't a super popular module, luckily. Um, but yeah, you can search for, there's a couple of different URLs that you can search for, and Google will kindly point out to you different people who have like the, the um, develop module, execute PHP block, or something like that, um, that's available to the world. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, I don't know that there's a collection of mistakes other than you know, um, on the security team mailing list because we get emails from people like, my site was hacked. Well, you have PHP available to the world. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so this is a, a video that I posted in case my demo didn't work, but luckily it worked. Um, so those are the three vulnerabilities that I wanted to talk about because they're the most common in Drupal um, and I think the most painful uh, ones to deal with. You know, they, they, can, they can be really, you know, depending upon what's behind it, depending upon what functionality you have in your site, they can be big issues. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some improvements to security that came with Drupal 7 um, and then Drupal 8 and uh, get everybody excited about upgrading to Drupal 8, right? Um, who's, who's on Drupal 6? Anybody want to admit it? Yeah? Okay, me too a little bit. Yeah, one site. Um, so uh, Drupal 7 improved the, the password hashing. Um, if you're using a Drupal, if you have a Drupal 6 site, I strongly encourage you to use a module called phpass, which is a backport of this functionality. Um, basically, Drupal 6 uses just an MD5 hash of passwords, which is um, you know, mostly not okay at all, um, and then also specifically forbidden by like FedRAMP, uh, I think. So. Um, PH pass on Drupal 6 or just upgrade to Drupal 7. Um, there's also login flood control in Drupal 7 that was added. There's, again, a backport module that's available for Drupal 6. Um, the idea is that if you try, you know, the default is if you try five times to enter a set of credentials, then you'll get locked out for an hour and you can no longer make attempts to log in. Um, you can get by it using the one time login. So if you've honestly forgotten your password and tried five times and locked yourself out, you can just use the one-time password link to get back in. Um, also, the, uh, the, you know, it used to be you could just visit cron.php on the site and set it off doing a variety of tasks um, that could you know, really slow down the server. So there's now that token that you have to use on the end of that URL to get it to execute cron. Um, and then the update manager, which I'm sort of mixed on. Um, is anybody using the update manager to like install modules through the Drupal interface? Not so much. Good. 
<laughs> um, that really scares me, right? Because you can download a tarball from anywhere on the internet and install it on a site. So if you have that available, then somebody who gets you know admin credentials on a site can really do a lot of damage. Um, on the other hand, if it makes it easier to update your modules, well, that's good. Um, so you know, I kind of go both ways on whether that one's helpful or, or hurt. Um, one thing I will suggest in the Drupal 7 update manager, uh, you know, you, you'll notice these things when you log into a site, but again, automate as much as you can, right? Um, so if you click on settings, on the, there's a menu item for settings inside of the available updates area, and you can add in your email address and say, email me about security issues. Uh, and then you'll get an email, I think, as often as it checks for updates, so daily potentially, um, which is, you know, a really good reminder that you need to do something. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't do this, I encourage you to have some other way to ensure that your site is up to date on security issues. Um, so, any questions on those Drupal 7 security improvements? Not so much? All right, so Drupal 8, things, things that may or may not actually come. Um, mostly will come. Um, so, Twig in Drupal 8 has, is our new templating engine or, or theming engine. Um, or, well, I'm probably using the wrong words there, but um, it's a new thing um, for, for printing stuff out. And it's, uh, you know, one thing that's really nice about it is that it has a potential to automatically sanitize strings in a sort of um, context appropriate way. Uh, and there's a patch to get that done. I think that it probably will get done for Drupal 8. So that's really exciting because cross-site scripting, as I said, 50% biggest issue, very complex, and this sort of handles it for us automatically. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, the other thing that's nice about that is no PHP and templates. Um, so if you, you, know, you want to allow somebody to um, change stuff, um, but you don't trust them to actually write PHP code and know what they're doing with it, then um, you can give themers the ability to use Twig and they won't have um, the ability to like, write queries that do really bad things. Um, another thing that's nice is WYSIWYG and Core. Um, you know, if only because it makes it easier to achieve something that everybody wants and is so hard to get right. Uh, the most important thing I think about this is that it keeps the buttons and the text formats in sync. And so, you know, if you add text formats, um, as you change your text formats, then the buttons will only work, you know, you'll, you'll only have things that actually are going to work. So you won't have, like, embed a YouTube video that's not allowed because your text format doesn't allow it. Um, there's another fun one, the local image filter. So the idea here is just that you know, people can only put an image into a post if that image exists on the server that's serving up uh, the site. And the benefit there is like you're not getting somebody putting in something that's inappropriate, that's hosted elsewhere on the internet as an image. So you can open up the image, to, the image tag to more users on the site, even if you don't fully trust them, just because this will ensure that those images are truly images and that they're only coming from your site, so hopefully trusted content. Um, the PHP module just, was just flat out removed, so Paranoia module has lost one of its reasons for existing. Um, it's just not possible to do PHP through the core PHP filter module. There probably will be contributed modules that uh, enable this, uh, uh, but uh, you know, we'll keep on fighting with Paranoia to get rid of them. Um, also, built-in CSRF tokens. So the, the third most common, I think it's third most common issue, the one we talked about um, with, you know, get links that are relatively, it's, it's sort of a pain, basically. We should just make this easier. So there's now this new item inside of your YAML file for underscore CSRF underscore token colon true. And that's basically all you have to do. And as long as you're using the L function to create your link, it will include an appropriate CSRF token. Um, so that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, all righty, so that's, that's basically it. We're, we're to the resources section. I mentioned my, my book. Also, there's a lot of blog posts on crackingdrupal.com. Um, and then in addition to the book, there's also a chapter in the definitive guide to Drupal 7. So if you can only buy one book, um, then there's at least a chapter, chapter in here. It doesn't cover code level issues, um, but it does, uh, it does cover a lot of security issues. And then some other resources uh, that you can, you can use. So the security team URL, drupalscout.com, has a lot of articles about security. Um, DrupalSecurityReport.org. I didn't talk about this too much, but it's it's a like ten page long basically white paper that the intended audience is you know probably everybody here, but then also um, like decision makers, managers, um, CISO, like those kinds of people. You can give them that page, and it'll say it'll help to convince them that the Drupal community actually takes security seriously. 
Um, and then I, I mentioned this idea for ongoing discussion if you're interested in it. Uh, Groups.drupal.org slash security um, is the place that you, know, you can say like, hey, I'm curious about whatever. Um, how does Drupal address this security issue? Um, and I mentioned, uh, with thanks to SCORE, Stefan Korlisket, um, who uh, you mentioned, Adam, um, in reference to the GDO, um, that is somebody who's involved in this community, so that's pretty cool. Um, but he helped to create these slides and then also wrote chapter six of Definitive Guide to Drupal 7. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's uh, all that I had planned to talk about, it. Um, and I think that I'm like a little bit over on time, sorry about that. No, um, no. Okay, yeah. great, so any questions that folks wanna talk about now, or? What do you guys want to do? Yes? Just on a, a, a sort of higher plane. Yeah. Um, when, when people say, well, why, you know, why did you choose Drupal and not WordPress? Or Jenga? Is there a security reason to choose Drupal? I mean, is Drupal potentially more secure for an enterprise uh, uh, level install or something? Is there something you can say about that? Yeah, well, um, I like the way that you phrased the question because you didn't talk, you know, I'm like an open source uh, fan, so I like the fact that all of the potential solutions are at least open source. Um, and I actually think that, that open source is really important for security reasons. Um, the, I think it was Department of Defense uh, CIO put out a, a memo in, um, in like 2009 where he was basically like, open source should be considered to be at least as good or better than proprietary closed source solutions. So I, I think that there's no longer a case for FUD when it comes to, or, or fear and doubt um, when it comes to open source solutions. So that's that's one of the first things that you, that you have to talk think about. Um, just one more point on that is that the White House has made a policy change now that uh, if you want to get software, you have to um, you have to make a case for why it should be a proprietary solution instead of an open source solution. So that's sort of their default now is that you have to look for an open source solution as step number one and closed source solution as you know, something that, that can be justified, that can be given an exception. Um, within open source solutions, I think, I mean, uh, if you look at like Plone and Zope, they they feel that they've created a very strong framework. I think that the framework plays a lot into it. Um, and I think that they do have a really strong framework for security. Um, they, if you look at the number of vulnerabilities that, that have been announced in those, um, in those platforms, it's relatively low. And I think that that does speak to the quality of the framework. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot fewer people who are using Plone and Zope. And so there's this question of like, do you have a good track record just because nobody's found the issues? Um, and it becomes really hard to say what is like truly secure or not. Um, I think one of the real strengths of the Drupal community is that everything is centralized around drupal.org. So you're not getting like random themes from other places. Um, there was a, a, a study a couple of years ago that somebody did of WordPress themes. And if you just search for free WordPress themes, nine out of the top 10 results on Drupal had malware in them. Um, and so this idea that like drupal.org you're not guaranteed to get secure content, but at least it's a controlled environment where if you're downloading modules from drupal.org, at least you have faith that if somebody found a vulnerability in it, it, was, it, it that there's a, a mechanism and a process to report those issues and either get them fixed or just get the item, you know, kind of not removed, but it, it gets a big red warning on it, right? Um, so I think that some of those process things are really important. Um, you know, the the... WordPress is somewhat more decentralized, so I see that as a weakness. I think that you know basically every project has really good security teams behind them. Um, I don't you know it's also something that people don't share a lot of details on, so it's hard to know like how active is the security team or not. How quickly are they fixing bugs? Um, it's the kind of thing that you know sort of people uh, gossip about, but don't really know any specific details. Um, I would say that one of the real strengths for Drupal is the access system, you know, even though it is a source of like 30% of vulnerabilities or 20%, it is really strong. And so if you need to do access control, then I think Drupal is, is a, a better solution. Um, but I think that Drupal's merits are, you know, security is certainly very strong, but for me it's more about the richness of the platform w when deciding between like Drupal and WordPress, for example, um, than it is about just straight up security, yeah. Got a couple other questions here in the Google box. If you yeah. added those, feel free to pipe in right now, or otherwise I can just read down through the list. Okay, so we've got one here that says, uh, 
So transitioning between major Drupal versions, major investment, so it's a key blocker to keeping code base secure. Will there be a Drupal 6 LTS? Yeah. That is, oh, yeah. Um, that's a tough question, right? Um, I would say that, so there, there was a, um, there's been a proposal to create a concept of a Drupal 6 LTS. Uh, you know, there's been a proposal to do that with every version of Drupal since as long as I've been involved. Um, there's always some people who don't want to upgrade. Um, I think that, you know, with the example of like MD5 password hashing, stuff like that, like stuff that was okay, uh, whatever it was, six years ago when Drupal 6 came out is just not acceptable anymore from a security perspective. So you have to like make sure that you're keeping up with certain contributed module that, contributed modules that backport the features that are in Drupal 7 and 8 um, into your site. I, um, there is now an announcement that the Drupal security team will support Drupal 6 for three months after Drupal 8.0.0 is released. Um, so there's at least a three month window of overlap, but that's when the uh, volunteer community based support for Drupal 6 will end. There is like a, um, a possibility or a proposal that uh, if people who are capable of maintaining core volunteer to do it or, or uh, more likely is get paid to do it, then, um, then the Drupal security team will sort of facilitate that effort and um, allow them to, to, to do that. Uh, and then those people will, as part of this framework, will be re requested or required to release their fixes through some sort of a project on Drupal.org that, uh, that would then be available freely to the community. So the idea is that, you know, maybe that there's a handful or even a couple dozen organizations who get together, find an organization that has um, the capability to do that and pay them to do it. And then the result of that work becomes free for everybody else. Um, so far, nobody has explicitly stepped forward. It seems very likely that Acquia would be one organization to do that. Um, there's a couple of other people who, uh, a couple of other organizations or people who I think have that capability. But, um, you know, from talking to them, I, I think that there's not interest to do it out, out of their own personal interest. It's more likely to come from um, being paid to do it. That said, you know, there's always a possibility, as I mentioned earlier, that more people join the security team. So if somebody says, I really care about Drupal 6, I want to do this, then, and they're, they have the ability to do it, then the security team would be happy to have them help out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, the big problem with Drupal 6 is that there's no automated testing suite for it, or it, there is one, but it's very limited. It's, it's nowhere near the, the level that Drupal 7 is. So like somebody will come up with a patch for Drupal 6 to fix a security issue, and they'll say, okay, what does this break? I don't know. Like I can test the 10 features that I care about on my site, but I'm not gonna, no, you know, nobody wants to go through the process of testing every feature. So we've had a couple of releases of Drupal 6 that actually did break things um, for, uh, you know, significant percent of the population of people using Drupal 6. Um, so it's really tough. I think that the Drupal 6 to 8.0.0 overlap of three months is sort of a beginning of a trend where there will be um, even more overlap of seven with nine. Yeah. But I mean, Drupal 6 is has been available since I think 2008. So that's a, that's a pretty long time for web software as it is. Yeah. Any other questions? I know it's about copy break, but maybe the rest of the questions in the Google box we can just send to you. And sure. Is that, is that cool? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, welcome and thanking Greg. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So it's about Thanks, everybody. Time, and, uh, I'm sorry, did you have Yeah, no, no, that was it. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we'll reconvene here back at 11. Um, I think you got to take off, right? So maybe we'll see you, Greg. Um, so feel free to shake his hand and ask a question here before he uh, has to head back. Um, otherwise, we'll see you at 11 for more discussion. So thanks.
Thank you so much. Yeah? Okay, cool. Here's this guy for him. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this, uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. I love the um, the like, the name of the group sounds like we're part of Starfleet Command yeah. or something. <laughs> the Federation. <laughs> the Federation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Know yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, I can I can do my best um to answer them and then. Um, also, you know, if, if something if something seems like it's applicable more broadly, then okay. um, like I can often just answer a question by pointing to a resource, or or like maybe we can um, put them into the GDO security group, and I'll still answer them. But okay. you know, at least then the knowledge is like right. more broad. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, same thing. Same thing that you guys are doing by having shared notes to share with everybody. But yeah, yeah. Just even yeah. a little further. Yeah, if you'd like to take those, if they're helpful to you in any way, just kind of share them. Yeah. Oh, I was curious, do you guys have any sort of. Um, I do have, I just don't have my board on that. I mean, I guess the, I'm happy to just get emails um, from people with any feedback that they might have. Yeah. Um, but. I don't know. Well, I mean, whatever. No, 